Okay, okay. Welcome again uh, back to New Ningo in Ghana. Welcome home, Leizade, as we said just a little while ago. Um, I'm Jerry Johnson. We're at the African Ancestry Wall at Malevna's restaurant in uh, New Ningo. Uh, the name is Malevna. It's named after this girl here who is Malevna. And uh, she's my daughter. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through and talk a little bit about uh, everyone on the wall. But I'm going to let her explain this first one. See, because the first one is a Pokakanyane who is a Frafra woman. Now, my, my daughter speaks Frafra. That's a northern uh, group. And so, Malebnas is a Fra, as I was mentioning to you before. So, since this is a Frafra woman, I let my daughter do a little explanation of who she is. Okay. She's done this once or twice, so let's see. But she's got a better memory than her dad, so it's probably going to be cool. Okay. So, Malevna, tell them about Apoka Kanyani. Apoka Kanyani was a Fafra woman from the northern part of Ghana. Young Apoka and their brother settled in a place called Bukere. This was the time when Africans were being caught by slavers and sent to work as slaves outside of Africa. One day, the slavers came. But they did not see any men, and they saw Apoka Kalayane pounding millet with a pistol. They asked her where the men were, but she did not understand their English. She pointed the pistol to the bush. Right when the slaver's boss was coming to was going to the bush, Apoka quickly turned and used the pistol he hit his head yeah. and he collapsed and died instantly right. mm. and the rest never came back yeah. mm. and now in the praises they say Tandunga which means the pistol turned into blood yeah. thank you yeah. 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 And, and this this is a pistol you know when they say pound that stuff with. so that's what she's talking about good job baby. Yeah. 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 You did well. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll continue with Queen T from the uh, 18th Dynasty, ancient Kemet. Uh, a lot of people know that Africa, I mean, what the Greeks later called uh, Egypt, uh, we called Kemet for almost a totality of all of the things that happened in Kemet that people brag about now. There was no one there but Africans, and I'm sure this crowd is aware of a lot of that. But Queen T is 18th dynasty, the wife of Amenhotep III, and also the mother of Akhenaten, who we'll talk about a little bit later on. Just one of the influential queens, um, and known far and wide, not just the beauty, but also the uh, wisdom. One of uh, our favorite, favorite queens. Now, when you first drove in here, you saw Marcus Garvey. <laughs> You saw Marcus Garvey, and uh, you know, it's no secret that we uh, try to hew to the Garvey line, especially in terms of um, having the confidence, building the confidence to build the national entity that we're going to have if we're ever going to be sovereign. Right. Now, I'm not calling that Ghana or Nigeria or whatever, but we know it's not uh, Compton and, 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 you know. Bedford Stag, that yeah, we know we for sure. Know yeah. So we know it's going to be on the African continent, how we pull that together. Garvey had the largest uh, black organization in the history of black folk that we know of, political organization. Uh, some five, six million members across countries all over the world. And you'd be surprised if you go to Tony Martin's Race First, Tony Martin's book Race First, in the back, he has a list of a lot of the places that Marcus Garvey had, UNIA had chapters. And I'll bet you you'll find your little hometown somewhere in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. It's amazing the penetration, you know, and across different countries, South Africa, Brazil, all over the place. That was Garvey. Up, you mighty people, you can accomplish what you want to or what you will. And we still have to keep that in mind. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah, you'll hear, of course, a lot about Nkrumah here in Ghana, so I don't have to go too far into it. But one of the reasons uh, I put this this quote up here because most Ghanaians know Nkrumah but they don't know how he thought about Garvey. Mm -hmm. So he read Hegel, Marx, Engels, Lenin and all of those but at the end nothing fired his enthusiasm like the 
uh, philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey. So that puts it in context for a lot of Ghanaians to know this Garvey was somebody serious. If, if their icon, you know, got so much from him, then we find things like the Black Star Line and all of that that they have here in Ghana today all came out of Garvey's UNIH. Uh, these two are, uh, this is the, the actual founder of the place here, Nuningo. This is uh, his first chief, Tejangma the first. And so um, since we're here in the area, we try to make sure that, that you know, we recognize the founders of the land we're standing on. And uh, his son is the, is the chief, or grandson, I believe, actually the chief today. If you looked, I don't know how many of you saw that, uh, that November program video. I don't think you've seen it. It's been up a couple of weeks. I'm going to have to get Bomani to put it on his thing. But we had a program here in November with a lot of people, and uh, the chief hit, uh, came and spoke and told a little bit about oh, it. Nice. So I'll make sure everybody gets it. If you just go to YouTube African Ancestral Wall, oh, yeah, it will yeah. come up uh, where some of those other videos that I have. So a lot of y'all have seen the videos from Malevna's Ocean View restaurant, guest houses. We got six guest rooms down there. I like to eventually build some more, but we'll see how that works out. <laughs> what, what is your occupancy like? How full are you usually? My occupancy is low because I'm, I'm not as good a marketeer as I do. I'm always, I'm, always jump, I'm always jumping off on the next project instead of you know, consolidating the last one. Some of us have short business attention spans. Uh, but this was Jamaica, although it's uh, fading fast. Ghana, Ethiopia, and, and our red, black, and green. Oh, okay. The red, oh, black, and green one? The first one. <laughs> Nobody knows. We who who knows? Black never black heard of that. Ignore him. Ignore him. Some small Exactly. Small shit on the Paintings were done by um, eight different artists. Oh, okay. So just they're all local Ghanaian artists. And, uh, wow. Some of them I had to do two or three times. Some of them need to be done two or three times more. But, uh, you know, we stop where we're at right now. Okay, um, we start with Eve over here. Now, a lot of, you know, I, good thing about having a crowd like this, you don't have to discuss all of the basics. Right. But one thing I forgot to mention is one of the criteria, or the main criteria I was using for choosing this, is the stories that I want to tell to the youngsters. So sometimes you may see someone who is, you know, maybe not as influential or as famous, mm -hmm. but there's something about them or something about their story that I want the youngsters to get. Now, usually, you know, Ghana is a, a, is a deeply Christian nation, mm -hmm. and I mean deep, deep. So when we come here and I, I talk about the first hum, human being, which right. I named Eve, quote unquote, coming 200,000 years out of, out of Southeast Africa, Eastern Africa, um, I have to do quite a bit of explaining mm -hmm. because, you know, first of all, to have an African woman saying that's the first known homo yeah. sapien sapiens, yeah. which is our that's group, right. yeah. is a uh, sh shock to the system for a lot of people yeah. because they've been looking at the missionary comics for about a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing. And the second thing oh, is, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we all know that. And the, and the other thing is that they um, just kind of take exception to the time frame, you know, the 200,000 years. And they always want to know why is it that, you know, their their face changed. If, if we're the mothers, of, parents of humanity, then where did the red-headed Irish come and the Chinese and all that. So we go through that little thing and we have the time with the students about, you know, evolving uh, migrations and how things change and all of that and why you have this nose, why you have light skin, the melanin content, the vitamin D, the UV rays, all of those things that, that are part of why, you know, we are who we are and what they look like, how they look. But the final message is being these are your wayward children. So you may have to do something to reel them back mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And they, unfortunately, they got guns and bombs, but they yep. still need some they discipline. Still have okay. they did. All right, so we'll leave it there. I think y'all know what's going on there. Yeah. But it's very important that I start with this because it really gets the mood for the crew. Because it's usually the teachers, they're like, wait, hold it, you know. <laughs> and they're the, you know, and the children are open. 
It's the, it's the teachers who's been, you know, but not all of them, fortunately. Shinwe Achebe, a lot of you know him through Things Fall Apart, one of the great writers and, uh, of our time. Uh, Ann Hills of the Savannah, uh, no longer at ease. And the main reason that I push him is because he's done such a good job of talking about not only after the colonial period ended and, you know, all of the contradictions that we had to work through as we had flag independence, as they call it, after the colonial times, but a lot of good writing about how we were prior to them coming and how it was when we met them. So this is good. So we really get a feeling of the stability and the depth of the culture and the functionality of the culture before anyone came in because they've got the people here in their own culture say nothing of in the U.S. thinking that before they came, we were just running amok. You know? So this is one good, good thing about Achebe. He always does that. And, you know, he was politically, you know, well, he was born as an Igbo and back during the Biafra Wars when they were, you know, the Civil War in Nigeria, he was a representative of the Igbos and a lot of other things in his bio, but mainly he's known for the writing. And almost everyone who comes in here has heard of Things Fall Apart because it's kind of like mandatory reading yeah. in literature classes all over the world. Okay, Asa Hilliard. Uh, Asa Hilliard has um, started a whole lot of us on this journey, you know. I think I was saying last time on the video that uh, I'd kind of considered myself at 19, uh, semi-radical type, but having, I had never really heard of the African origin. I never heard of the classical African civilization side of it. And so when I got that and added to the kind of fire that I had just as what I considered a, you know, just a black, na I don't know if I was saying nationalist at the time, but whatever. But when I got heard Asa talk about that history, it really made it hold. And he did a lot for us. And he always had time for everyone no matter how big or small, he'd make time. I, I said before, you know, he had written a, a bibliography, gave us all kind of notes, and actually mailed them to me, you know, to read, start reading. And that was, um, you know, like 1978 or nine or something. So that got us started. So, and then, and of course, he's done a lot on curriculum. Uh, he's done a lot of, he's a psychologist and an Egyptologist and a historian. So. That's Bob Ace. If you know him, if you don't, get online right away and start looking at his uh, lectures on uh, and his writings. He's also a chief. It says Ghana here, but he was also a a, a chief here in Ghana, Ghana uh, Bafour. Um, uh, yeah, Nana Bafour. I actually forget the, the last part, but he was recognized here as a developmental chief in Ghana. Okay, Yah Santua, you hear a lot. You all are going to Kumasi, I'm assuming. Yes. So you hear a lot more about Yah Santua, Queen Mother of Ijisu. And, um, you know, she basically was the leader of the last Ashanti Wars fought against the British. So, you know, there was about a hundred years, a century of warfare, the Ashantis against the British. Which is a very interesting and important history because, once again, you know, to fight the British, who were the world power at the time, for a hundred years mean that you had some level of sovereignty, some level of cohesion, some level of organization, and more, most importantly, some level of cultural determination to fight for maintaining what you consider to be your God right. See, nowadays, I, I contend that we've really kind of lost that. You know, we're, this idea that, you know, sovereignty is natural. Hmm. Now it's kind of like we haven't had it for so long, we've almost forgotten what it's like. But anyway, the Yah Santua Wars, and you'll hear a lot of her other speeches and presentations as you go along. Uh, Didan Kimati, uh, you know, they derogatorily used to always talk about the Mau Mau. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was growing up here, y'all just Mau Mauing, you know. But they were the Kikuyu Land Freedom Army, and basically they had to organize themselves again against the British in this case, who had come into Kenya at the time, taken all the best land, best farmland, and still have kept some of it, but it's not like South Africa. So uh, Didon had to take to the bush with uh, this Kuyu Land Freedom Army and try to fight their way into uh, some kind of repossession of their assets. And because of that pressure, you know, people like uh, Kenyatta and the other ones, when they came into it, they were able, I think, to have more success. Kind of like we talk about Brother Malcolm put the pressure on so the 
less radical elements could get somewhere. So you gotta have the hammer in the back. So that's Didon Kamanti. He said, look, this struggle is gonna take blood and it's gonna take living with lice on you. It's gonna take all of those things, but you know, you want your freedom, so what you gotta do. And by the way, the president of this country is Jerry Rawlings. And he's named his son Kimathi. So a lot of times when the Ghanaians come and they see Kimathi, they, they know that name. And so that's, and then this is the actual picture of him when, after they captured him, before they executed him. Dion Kimathi. In Zynga, a lot of y'all heard of in Zynga. Okay, I won't go too far, but you know, back to this is like 15 uh, hundreds. So just struggling. And of course, she did some things trying to compromise and deal with people thinking that she was dealing with people you could compromise oh, with and yeah. negotiate with. Yeah. But I think once it became clear what was going on, mm -hmm. uh, that's her legacy of the struggle and the fight against, in this case, the Portuguese. Once again, trying to maintain sovereignty and once again losing it because of a military disadvantage. And that mm -hmm. theme runs through our history, unfortunately. Right. Uh, Sergeant Cornelius Ajete for the Ghanaians, he's one of one of the heroes uh, back in, um, in 1948, you know, the Ghanaians and a lot of the Africans fought on the side of the quote unquote allies, you know, the, the British in, the, in World War II. Uh, they excelled at fighting in Burma and these other places, but they were supposed to get their due. And as usual, when it was time to collect, the British said, well, you know, we don't think so. <laughs> so, so, yeah, you know, so I'll get a little closer here. Too, so. Okay. I don't block yeah. the mountain. So, so basically him and two other ones, they marched on the capital here in Accra at Christianburg to get their uh, due. They were shot down by a British major uh, named Emery, and that sparked and killed three of them, him and two other ones. And that sparked the Accra riots. And that's uh, when they had jailed in Kruma and the so-called Big Six, and then eventually they got out. And you know, it was kind of that straw that really was the catalyst for breaking the back of the colonial system at the time, which was already, of course, under strain. So he's a god man, and he's uh, one of their national heroes. I still haven't been able to find out exactly when he was born. Maurice Bishop, I think a lot of you remember him from you know, I was, uh, they only have 100,000 people in the country, you know, probably smaller than Kalamazoo or something. But uh, the U.S. still saw it fit to invade him. Right. But why did they really invade Grenada? Yeah. Some of us remember that was during the Reagan administration. Right. And they invaded Grenada because when he took over with the New Jewel movement that they had, the New Jewel movement had reduced unemployment from 50 to 14%. They had uh, reduced reliance on imported food, brought that down to some small number. Uh, you know, they were putting in an international or bigger airport for their, uh, you know, tourist reasons. They all but eliminated illiteracy, got it up. And of course, they were aligned with Cuba and Castro and all of that. And this was like, we're just not going to have a black Cuba and a black Castro in the Caribbean. He's got to go. The threat of a good example. So that's Maurice Bishop. He was an attorney and just an orator. And the interesting thing, if you look around, you can even see where, let me just throw this. Do you all remember um, Bewitched? Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. You know the lady, uh, Elizabeth Montgomery? Right. Yeah. She did, I don't know if you've ever seen, she's done a, uh, she's done the narration on a document. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm getting that mixed up with Panama. She oh. did one on Panama. You oh, got to okay. see that one okay. too. <laughs> you got to see that one too. But anyway, um, Oh, one other thing I wanted to add about him is that not only was he, you know, charismatic and all of this, but politically, you know, they had aligned with, you know, like El Salvador's FMLN and uh, SWAPO in South Africa, you know, Southwest Africa. So he had, he's punching above his weight. You can imagine this guy in a small country like this putting out this kind of influence. It's like, no, this, this guy's got to go. So well, we praise his man. CIA. Okay. How do you spell that? <laughs> okay, now here we talk about the, uh, the, the Mino or the Namitan warriors. These are the women who fought in what is now Benin. Uh, back then you can, they fought with uh, Behanzen, but they were originally brought as bodyguards and eventually they became trained as very uh, ferocious soldiers. Mm -hmm. And someone here who was here with you last time, Bumani, I think that was with you, were saying that 
the uh, movie Black Panther had modeled those I'm women just after the, the Black Amazon. Black Panther. Yeah, That's someone, where they I get him. Said that, which, 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 which I believe. I'm gonna take but, a picture but you of that. can read uh, if you take some time. You can read what the French talked about these these women, how they trained, how determined they were, and how you know they would fight. They had some kind of saying that the women is if you're a soldier going to war, uh, you either die or you conquer. Right. Mm. <laughs> right. Nothing else, mm. you know. Right. And that's the Namitan or the Mito, which mean Mino, which means our mothers, by the way. In the Fon language, F O N, Fon is the language they speak in Benin. It's related to the Ewe language that they speak here. They're all called Be languages. There's a group of them in Nigeria, Benin, Togo. Okay. Edward Wilmot Blyden, a lot of us have heard of him. Edward Wilmot Blyden was uh, really one of the fathers of Pan-Africanism with him and uh, um, uh, eight Sylvester Williams out of Trinidad. Uh, in fact, he wrote a book called Africa for the Africans, you know, the name of the group. In 1887, wow. oh, it, yeah, I think it was 18, that's when Garvey was born, you know, so he, long before Garvey was saying it, you know. But anyway, what he's really known for is just his intellectual firepower, you know. He's written those books. Uh, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race is probably the most uh, well-known of his books. Born in the Virgin Islands yep. in St. Thomas, but he's yeah, right. taught in Nigeria, taught all around, and ended up being a uh, fixture in Liberia, where he was president of college, he was actually into politics. You know, just ambassador, he did all kind of things. But just a brilliance. And I remember I first heard his name when John Henry Clark was talking about how they started their studies with a thing called the Blyden Society, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how their first little study group back in 1920 or 30, you know, something like that. Edward Wilmot Blyden. Steve Biko. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the movie made about him, Cry Freedom, which they spent a lot of money on and had Denzel, didn't let Steve say too much before he was gone, and then we had to watch this other guy for another hour and a half or whatever. But Steve Biko, South Africa, of course, they tortured him, they imprisoned him, they did everything to Steve Biko. He was uh, started the South African Student Organization and of course brought in the Black Consciousness Movement, really just saying, look, be black, be conscious, be proud, here's who we are. And he wrote under the name of Frank Talk in these journals that used to come out all the time. Finally, they figured out who he was. So if you go now and you read um, I Write What I Like by Steve Biko, a lot of that are collections of essays that were in Frank Frank Talk that he wrote about. And anyway, uh, one of the intellectual uh, giants too of South Africa. Here we got our man Sony Ali. You know, a lot of you have heard of the Mali, uh, Ghana Mali, Songhai Empire. He was the first uh, established the Songhai Empire. The Songhai Empire was important because, well, not only did it finally overtake the Mali Empire, which is not a, so much in itself, but that. <clears throat> He was, you know, everything was Islam, of course, at that time. And he was still practicing the African traditional religions. Mm -hmm. So ostensibly he was, you know, practicing Islam because that was the trading religion and everything. But he never let go of his African <laughs> tradition. And so that was kind of a, always a point of contention. And then, of course, after he was gone, they, they kind of erased that. But, he, had, he really organized the place into kind of a federated arrangement with governors and districts and, and all of these things. Had a navy on the Niger River, was like four to six hundred ships. And uh, of course he was a reformer in terms of just uh, how the state was organized and how production and economy was organized. But Hans and I just mentioned him with the, uh, with the Namatana, the ladies there. Uh, but Hans was a struggle against the French. Now you know, in every country you go to, like someone can come here from Benin today mm -hmm. and they won't like uh, Bahanzan or someone can come, they won't like Haile Selassie because inside any one country, you know, you have different factions. You've got people who don't like Nkrumah, mm -hmm. you know, in this country. You know, so it's, it's always that way. So they're the Fon, which are in the south of the country, and there was heavy <coughs> slaving going on with the Fon. Now he came during the uh, colonial period, so he was mainly known more for you know, resisting the French and all of that. But um, the Hansen was, um, they call him the great shark because the shark was one of the totems and they say an angry shark attacks the helm. And they considered him to be an angry shark. So that's the Hansen. 
The great Mama Africa. Mm -hmm. You, you want to? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, keep on going. You're doing. Okay. You're doing well. Appreciate I it. You were doing oh no. Uh, Mary McKibba, the great Mama Africa. Right. You know they. Uh, she spent most of her time out of the country because you know mm -hmm. once she went out, they took her passport and wouldn't let her come back. Mm -hmm. But you know she was a, a dedicated fighter to anti-apartheid regime in South Africa. Her songs, her culture, her cliques, her language, everything she did just exuded Africa uh, all the way to the end. But yeah, she was married at one time to uh, Stokely Carmichael, who's uh, Kwame uh, Ture, and they lived in Guinea together for I think about a decade before she, you know, she spoke at the UN, you know, against the apartheid regime. So not only was she uh, just a talented singer, but um, knew who she was loyal to, yeah. and mainly stuck with that culture, which is, at the end of the day, we're really where your power lies. The great Sheikh Ante Jok, a lot of you have been getting into the uh, African origins of civilizations, you know Sheikh Ante Jok and uh, Theophil Obenga and the rest of them have gone in and proven, I think now beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the ancient, you know, the people who people ancient Egypt were all black Africans and I don't think there's much doubt about that now. Although like here in Ghana I'm talking to people, it's a hundred percent doubt about it because you know all they see is Arab football players yes. and Egypt is Arab to them mm -hmm. and they can't imagine all of these other things. But you know I, I when I bring them through here sometimes I'll have more information or I have more pictures or I'll have different things. We'll go upstairs and we'll go somewhere and talk so I can elaborate on it. But um, African origins, civilizations, civilization of barbarism, pre-colonial Africa, um, uh, black Africa, cultural, economic uh, foundations of federated state. All of those are books by Sheikh Anta that you should try to get a chance to read because he's very practical. Mm -hmm. The great Desalé, yes. you know, he was the number two man for, for uh, Toussaint L'Ouverture when Toussaint was uh, tricked or captured by the French. Mm -hmm. uh, Dessalines took over. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a lot, uh, what the French would say, ruthless. Uh, what we would say is practical. Yes, <laughs> you know, in terms of who he was dealing with. Right. You know what I mean? And you know, uh, the Haiti, by the way, is, is the original name. Of course, it was Santa Domingue, uh, the French would call it. But the the uh, Arawaks who lived there, when the French came and everyone came, called the place mm -hmm. Haiti. So when he got in charge, instead of naming it something else, he named it after the folks who named it the first time. So that was uh, George. <laughs> George Washington Carver. Yeah. You know, you have to have George Washington Carver for the brilliance, the genius. And uh, I explained to them how all of these major colleges, universities, and institutions all wanted this brilliant scholar for his, you know, agricultural genius. And um, but you know, he stayed with Tuskegee, he stayed with the, with the black institutions. And so I tell him about the soybean, and I tell him about the crop rotations, and how he basically saved the agriculture productivity of the South, mm -hmm. and about uh, how he was able to basically talk to plants. You know, one time they asked him, how do you know so much about the plants? He says, I asked them. You know, and they all said, oh. <laughs> but there's a book called, by the way, there's a book called, um, I just found my copy. Well, someone just returned it, but I didn't know I had it. Called the Secret Life of Plants. Secret yeah, Life of Plants. Plant. Secret Life yeah. of Plants. Yeah, and you remember Stevie Wonder had an yes, album yeah. called, yes. and I didn't know what that was about. Yeah. That what book is amazing. If you ever get a chance to find mm -hmm. it, and they talk about they talk about him, yeah. along with other things. It's just the Secret Life of Plants. Secret Life of Plants. Secret Secret Life of plants. plants. No. 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 It's an excellent book. But anyway, we know him. Uh, Julius Nerere, uh, one reason we, one reason we really, really um, like and, and sing the praises of Nerere in Tanzania is because he was able to mix, you know, that humanism uh, with some hardcore uh, politics and even some hardcore security matters. So for instance, you know, Tanzania was, was one of the places where the frontline states could, you know, where these states were in all kinds of, having all kinds of problems, whether it was ANC in South Africa, PAC in South Africa, Frelimo in Mozambique, and these kind of places. 
but always use his place as a staging ground, use his place uh, for logistic support and financial and even military support against the white dominated regimes in Southern Africa. But on the flip side, internally, domestically, you know, he was able to have that, you know, uh, Ujima type uh, family cooperative economics. They put co-ops together all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I was just watching one of the scholars of uh, old Tanzanian scholars. He's actually an Indian guy. It's a uh, um, something, I uh, forget exactly the name, talking about even today how Tanzania is a little bit different than most African countries in terms of their ability to get along across ethnic groups and you know just uh, so and he stepped down which is another thing a lot of them don't ever want to leave but he said you know it's time to go yeah. he'd been there a long time you know he was still of sound mind and everything but he yeah. decided it was time to go uh, Ephraim Mamu, Ephraim Mamu is an Ewe here in Ghana. He's from the, the town of, the village of Peke, uh, not so far from here. Um, the reason I put him here is because I read about him when I first got here. You know, his, his adherence and his insistence on the Ghanaian culture, mm -hmm. his insistence on the songs, the, the clothes, the local instruments and all of that, trying not to just get completely overrun by Western everything. And uh, he was tenacious, and some of his songs, he's written songs they use like, almost like national anthems, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, very influential, and he's also on, on their old money. I don't think they put him on the new money. Different Mamu. And the thing I was trying also to kind of distribute different uh, Ghanaian groups. So like Ajete was a Ga, uh, he's an Ewe. He has the Northerners and other Ewe's and things, but you know, just trying to let the different, because when the students come through, you never know where they're going to come through. Sometimes they come through and they're mainly airways, sometimes they're mainly Ga, Dangbe, what have you, so try to have that mix. You know, Harriet Tubman, I always use this as an opportunity to explain to them, you know, the horrors of slavery, you know, something, yeah. because they really have no clue. I mean, yeah, yeah. They, they just, I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, so, you know, we talk about Harriet Tubman and what she had to go through to, to get our people out of there and the sacrifices and, and just how hard it was. Yeah. So, that's a black Moses, as they sometimes like to say. Samora Michelle and Mozambique. Now, Samora Michelle was actually trained as a nurse, but um, he excelled in all kinds of academics. But at the end, he turned out to be a great, great leader. He was the number two man trained by Eduardo Manlani, who we'll talk about a little later. When Manlani died, he took over and once again uh, spent his time training militarily uh, under uh, Nereri's uh, Tanzania. But Mozambique, of course, they were colonized by the Portuguese. So he fought vicious battles from the, the, the coast of Tanzania, or the border of Tanzania. He fought his way south for four years against the Portuguese. Uh, basically putting so much pressure on them along with some of the other uh, African leaders fighting Portuguese colonial power that, that they eventually collapsed. But he was killed unfortunately uh, in an aircraft accident over South African airspace and you know people think that they you know rigged the navigation system so it ran them into a mountain. Mm -hmm. So that's how he died. And his wife, his wife is the one uh, who had married Nelson Mandela later on. Uh, Nanny is Jamaica. Somebody here is from Jamaica, right? Nobody's from Jamaica. Okay, nobody's from Jamaica. So y'all know? So nobody's from Jamaica. I can tell. I can tell when you said it. You, but you weren't from Jamaica. Why is it nobody from Jamaica? Yeah. But anyway, you know, they think, you know, she's born in Ghana and they think Nanny was Nana, you know, Nana, uh, and, and of course you know the story if you were there, you lived there with Nanny Town and the Maroons and all of that, but it's, it gives me a chance to explain to the children here about how even in the face of overwhelming force, or what we considered overwhelming force by the British, you know, we still had people that fought for space and fought and won and forced them into relinquishing what they considered to be their realm of power, right? And so, and then also, you know, names like uh, 
Chermatang and, and Kampong and these kind of, and, and Kujo, you know, these are Akan names, mm. you know, so, you know, so even some people in Jamaica, I'm not sure they know exactly where all these names come from, but when you hear them there, you know they're Akan names. But of course, you know the story of Nanny and the British. Haile Selassie, uh, who's Rastafari, you know, born Liege Makonan, uh, Liege Tafari Makonan. And uh, there's a, th this is another one, you know, sometimes, you know, the Amharics have been in that dominant position, at least politically, and there are people who come here from Ethiopia who, I mean, they're stone cold silent as I'm talking about, because, you know, they're from different groups and they're saying, this guy shouldn't be a hero. We have other people from Ethiopia. Uh, but anyhow, uh, you know, Ethiopia was one of the oldest uh, Christian churches, ancient Christian churches in the world, mm -hmm. and they had that long-running uh, independent Christian tradition. And when Menelik died and he was uh, looking for, trying to pick successors, you know, the one that he kind of chose with this uh, Yasa, or Yasa, Alij Yasa, or Ras Yasa, I guess he would be at that time. And Selassie was, was not the choice. So there was a whole lot of intrigue back and forth, but what basically happened, one thing that happened is, is Yasa was, people suspected secretly he was a Muslim, you know, because he was doing all kinds of things and giving all kinds of preference to Muslims and everything. And so that suspicion made the royal court and some of them come together and say, uh, uh, Rastafari was going to be the man. Mm -hmm. And of course, Haile Selassie is the, is the kingship name, or the uh, Gaez name, actually, when we get to that position. But you know, he's known for a lot of reforming and a lot of things. And, uh, and, for, and fortunately, we have a good history of Africans from the diaspora coming in to try to support the Ethiopian government during the Italian invasion. You can see some of those news clips are still around where brothers are lining up in New York or in, in the south somewhere saying, we want to go to Ethiopia to fight for the Ethiopians against the Italians. And if you look around, you can find those videos. And that was during this time. Uh, the great, uh, uh, I call him the great, uh, PA for Kianki, 25th Dynasty Egypt. This is a uh, after the third interregnum period where, you know, there was some confusion and unbalance, they came back up from the south and kind of reconsolidated power in ancient Kemet, which was really the last uh, black uh, uh, dynasty, <coughs> dynasty in Kemet and then from that time. Because now, but see, what I try to explain to the youngsters is that now we're talking 714 BC. BC. Well, you know, we started this thing 4000 BC, you know, or 3100 for the d dynastic formal dynastic period, but long before for the pre-dynastic. So all of those thousands of years and you still have Africans running the show. Because in this time, the Greeks weren't there, right? All these other Arabs certainly weren't there. They didn't come until 680. And so it's good to just keep that context for the youngsters. But anyway, he came back, reconsolidated, and they tried to call it the Nubian dynasty, the black dynasty, as though the other ones weren't. So you gotta be very careful. They, they have conceded that this is a black dynasty as though the other ones were not. So you had to go back and say, no, this is another black dynasty. Shaka, the Zulu king. You know, Shaka, one of the things that he really did that was important was to consolidate power, consolidate land, consolidate different ethnic groups to make them uh, defensible against a European onslaught. So that's why you don't hear that much progress of people making inroads into Zululand, you know, during that century. So now we get, now the movie Shaka Zulu, of course, has him as this bloodthirsty, crazy tyrant who dis disrespecting the women and the mothers, and it's all this craziness. But, you know, in reality, the Zulu tradition is very strong, probably not allowing any of that kind of stuff that you saw in the movie. And of course, you know about, it is true, some things are always accurate, you know, like, you know, changing the mode of, of fighting with the big, the big uh, shields and the short, us, uh, you know, sword, stagger, dagger type things. That's a great shock of consolidator of the Zulu state. Fanny Lou Hamer, you know, we know her, sick and tired of being sick and tired. We, uh, I, I use this one mainly to explain to them about how even in my generation, I'm 60, 
even when I was small, I can remember voting problems, you know, because we were around in the South here and there, and you know, it was an issue. Who's going to get the vote? So then I explained to him about how she took a seat, you know, and took her delegation to the uh, Democratic Convention as the uh, Mississippi Freedom uh, Democratic uh, Party, and, uh, and just a woman of courage and how they beat her and tortured her and imprisoned her and did all of these kind of things. And I'm trying to make the case of them, this is all just because they wanted to vote. She hadn't done anything, she just wanted to go to the ballot. You know, these Ghanaian children listen to that with just utter disbelief, you know. In America, you know, because what they see is Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. This is a whole nother subject. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked me the other day, is it, you put Barack Obama on the wall? Please no. no. I said, hey, Barack Obama is not, my answer is, Barack Obama is not an ancestor. Okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yes, you're then, right. And of course, they come back and say, well, if he was an ancestor, would you put him on the wall? No. I said, which wall? <laughs> the hell wall. I, I just keep answering questions with questions. Oh, yeah. so, no, this wall, this one? No. <laughs> okay. Base three. So what you'll see on some of these larger ones, these are, um, Ones that either are Ghanaians of real high prominence, or in the middle, some of just some more of my favorites in addition to the front wall. Tokbe Sri, uh, he's an Ewe leader. The Ewe's were originally, actually probably in Nigeria, but they really consolidated the, the Bay group, which is the Fawn and the Ewe and the others, in uh, Togo, a place called Norche, actually in Benin and Togo. So he is the one that brought them out of there into Ghana. So most of the airways that you meet are along the southern corridor anyway, on those, and uh, he was the one who brought them away from this wicked king. You know, they have this long story about how they escaped and how they outsmarted the wicked king to get out, but he was the one that led them here. So Togbe is street. Togbe is like king or, or chief or something. The first. Now, for the gods, Taki Tawia is kind of the, you know, I, I basically ask people who, who different gods, who would they have, and Taki Tawia normally came up. He's, you know, just a reformer right at the turn of the century, so he was right there during the colonial period when they were getting ready to be being colonized, but uh, did a lot to reform and reorganize the god nation and um, made them, put them in a better position anyway to survive through the colonial era. And if you go down to Makola, you'll see a big statue of him down there. If you guys go to Makola Market, I don't know if you're going there or not. Okay, now I jump back here to ancient Kemet, 3100 BC. Uh, we know this is the head because this is the, the stone carved head that's still in existence. And I forget which European uh, <laughs> museum. But this is Menes or Narmer. This is the first picture we have of the, the pharaoh in the first dynasty. It may not be the first pharaoh in the first dynasty, but he was one of the early pharaohs in the first dynasty. And what's important about that, again, to the Ghanaians, is that, you know, they see all of these movies with all of these European pharaohs and these people, you know, these Hebrews carrying these two and a half ton blocks. I don't know exactly how they do it. <laughs> but of course, everybody's white, you know. So I tell them, this guy could just, you know, I saw him this morning when I was getting some bread, you know. I mean, if this is not African, this is not African, this is not African, there ain't no African, you know. So there he is. And so they I let him meditate on that face for a little while. And I said, so when you go back and watch that movie and open up your biblical text and see all of these people, you know, there was some flim flam going on. You'd be surprised how shocking that is for people here. Yeah. No, you're taking it away from me. But not everybody. We have a lot of people who know something's wrong with that story. Yeah. Yeah. They just need somebody to kind of give them a little more information on how they've been hoodwinked. Yeah. Amakar Cabral, probably one of the greatest thinkers, leaders, strategists, revolutionaries, uh, revolutionaries uh, that we've ever seen. You know, not to say Castro is the uh, judge, but even according to Castro, of all the leaders he saw, this guy is a cut above. And if you read him, you know, return to the source of some of the other books that he read, you know, his, just his vision, what had to be done, and the way he was able to use culture. You know, we talk about cultural power. 
I mean, his, his was cultural power in effect. I mean, these people felt some kind of deep commitment to staying free. And doing, and the other thing, you know, he was an agronomist, so he was teaching them also how to, to live independently. You know, so even when all of the pressure was on, you still have these things where you can feed yourself and the technology that's appropriate to where you are. And you know, he just had all of the answers. You know, of course, he was killed. Um, but very soon after, of course, the Portuguese had their quote unquote revolution, which was basically the fact that, you know, they're losing soldiers, they're losing revenue, they're losing everything in these endless wars in Africa. And uh, the Africans are winning. So they raised up and uh, kicked out the Portuguese government, and uh, that's how the Portuguese Revolution was really, really kicked off. And no one had more to do with it. In fact, the Portuguese need to have some statues of him up there in Lisbon, saying this is the reason that we finally got free from the real folks. Of course, they're quickly replaced by new ones. Cabral. The great Imhotep. Where's my boy? Uh, they know Ernest! Malumna! Uh -huh, he snuck out on me. My boy's going to tell you about him, Hotel. I'm going to have him get all of these so I can stop talking. <laughs> Turn it over to them. Damn right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yo, yo, yo. This is Abba Bagre. We also call him Ernest after my, after my daddy. And, uh, hey, hold on, man. Give me time to pat his pro a little bit. He's going to tell you about Imhotep. Imhotep. Go ahead, bro. The floor is yours. Imhotep. Imhotep was born more than 4,000 years ago. He was born in, he was an African born in ancient Kemet. Kemet is the name they used for their country thousands of years ago before the Greeks came and called it Egypt. Imhotep is a multi-genius, which means he's an expert in many things. He's an architect who designed and built the step pyramid in Zakara. He's also a medical doctor. He was the first medical doctor in the world. His medical writings show more than 48 injuries. It's it's in our blood and it's in our history. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Turned 10 yesterday. You know, when, in fact, when you did the video last year, remember I was saying he had just had a birthday? See, that was almost a year ago just today. We just had a birthday. In fact, we got in late. I got in late with the cake. And I said, oh, we can still eat it. He said, no, we got to wait till tomorrow. In other words, it wasn't big enough fan base for him to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no cake at night, just few of us. That wasn't going to work. I, I, I get you. That. So anyhow, that's him who is multi-genius. Okay. One thing I do want to add is that you know, I had some doctors come through here once. Uh, they're staying in our room. And uh, I walked them through the wall. You know, these doctors, you know, they're, you know, doctors, mm -hmm. medical doctors. And I mentioned to them that when they took the Hippocratic Oath, that they were, uh, yeah. and they said they were going to, you know, due to the standard of Asclepius, Asclepius mm -hmm. was in And so you guys, whether you knew it or not, and then all these other doctors around the world, are, you know, basically trying to live up to the standard of the father, the real father of medicine, Asclepius, who the Greeks tell you right there is in Hotel. So they kind of, you know, they were all looking around, you know, <laughs> incredulously. And then somebody slipped off, I think, and looked at the thing and came back and it's true. Oh, I said, all right, mm -hmm. so the doctors knew almost everything. <laughs> they, they know everything. But anyhow, that's a great emphasis. Ernest told you all about it. Uh, and you can see when you, when you go to this uh, YouTube thing, him and my daughter and a whole lot of other children talking about different people on the wall, giving the presentation. It's really nice. Uh, the great Toussaint Louverture, we mentioned him just a little while ago, Haitian Revolution. They've never forgiven the Haitians for kicking them out. 
establishing really the first republic in the hemisphere. And uh, of course we know he was tricked, but just imagine the enormity of the task. And you know, they say he was a fawn heritage, you know, father or grandfather, and um, Napoleon's army. And so for the youngsters, they'll know Napoleon, because you know, they gotta yeah. learn that. And I said, well, this guy kicked Napoleon's whole army out of there. All right. And they're all looking at each other like, that Napoleon? Said, the one that you said, that they told you never lost. He lost. A, a lot. Four Waterloo. A, a lot. This is, his, this is African Waterloo. So that's the great Toussaint. Uh, now back to a couple of Ghanaians, Nagbewa. Nagbewa is the father of a lot of the northern groups, like the Moshe, who are still over in the, mainly in the Burkina Faso, the Dagombas, the Mamprusis, the Anumbas, a lot of them come from the line of Nagbewa. And you know, at 1400, I'm just drawing pictures of people. I don't have a picture of the brother, so. I just got a Ghanaian northerner and said, hey, you want to be a model? I said, yeah, why not? So Nagbewa, the great father of the, a lot of the northern tribes, northern ethnic groups. We'll say Tutu, you'll see more about him. They'll have some other uh, pictures of him or drawings of him when you go to Kumasi, go through the palace and everything. I've seen different types, so I wasn't really trying to replicate theirs because I knew I was going to mess it up. So I just decided to have somebody, you know, do another version of it. But Jose Tutu, and you'll hear the story of him and the Confanoche and the Golden Stool and, you know, all of the, the drama around that. So you hear more about that when you go to Kumasi. But the first is Santahini, uh, the Akanji Ashanti. Burkina Faso had a great young leader, Thomas Sankara. Some of you may remember him. I know he was known for, well, but he changed his name from Haute Volta, which is Upper Volta in French, to uh, Burkina Faso, land of the upright people. And um, what I what I focus on when I look at him is um, the fact that, you know, he was telling all these international financial institutions that we can't pay, you know, we're a small country, we can't pay all of these own, onerous debts. And he said, if we don't pay it, you won't, you won't suffer. If we do pay it, you know, we're going to starve. So we're we just not paying it. We don't like how it came about, how it came into being. We consider it illegitimate. And then he told African leaders at one conference, and I read that, that he said, look, I'm not paying it. But if I stay by myself this time next year when we meet, uh, I won't be here. And that's what came to pass. You know, they got rid of him using, as they do a lot of times, his Lieutenant Campari. But Campari was just kicked out a couple of, a few years ago. He's been in since, since uh, 87. And uh, the young people who grew up with this uh, Sankara mindset, although they were quiet, subdued because they were suppressed, finally broke out a few years ago and got rid of that guy. Now they're still struggling because, you know, once you get rid of one thing, the international community comes in and tries to impose something else on you. So the struggle continues, but uh, Sankara was, and I think if you look at the video I did last year, I was talking about uh, how when I went to his grave site, they have it, this was in 2007 or 8, you have to walk through this uh, landfill basically to get to it, which was just a way of saying don't go as far as I was concerned. But we managed to get through there, and when I got there, there was a little boy who was saluting, he's a little guy, and I'm looking down there. When he saw me, you know, he dropped his salute, turned around and marched off. That was 2007. I said, no, they're not done, you know. And then 2000, a few years ago, they, they shook him out of there. Now, this one is very important for the, for the young men and women. But, you know, Amen Arenas was one of the Kandakis, one of the, uh, the queens of, uh, of Kush. What, what time was What's the time? Noon. I don't know if they're quite ready. We, we can just go on and finish. With the other. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. okay, we'll just go on and we don't have to. Unfortunately, yeah. it's not too hot. We might not be lucky if we break and come back. Okay, so anyhow, uh, in Kush, you know Kush is basically a Nile Valley civilization. Uh, we're talking 60 BC. So this is really important for me telling not just the young girls, but the boys, all of them which is that at this time the Roman army, which once again, if you're a Ghanaian student, you have to know all about the Roman army. I can tell you, I got two children and they bring this stuff home and then we got to know 
what shoes they wore and what was on the bottom of the what shoes. kind of nonsense is that and all man? of this you know what color was the capes and you know what was their formations i mean i'm looking at this going this is way more than you need to know about the roman army mm -hmm. but so and that's common among say Ghanaian students mm -hmm. so and i explained to them when the roman army romans by now had taken over ancient egypt it was Kemet. i mean it was egypt then by then and then they moved south to conquer the southern Nile Valley. Mm -hmm. When they moved south and got to Kush, of course, they run into the Kandakis, the African queen, mm -hmm. and the Menorenus was the one they ran into. And of course, they had several battles which she won, mm -hmm. or at least enough to neutralize them and send them out of there. And not only did she send them out, but the, her and the, and the following Kandakis queens were able to force them into the treaty. Now, this is the great Roman army that all my children are all over. And the treaty lasted 300 years. So that tells us, you know, we knew what sovereignty was. You know, we knew what power was. We knew what it meant to be, you know, have enough power to, to compel others to, you know, march to our dictate. 300 year treaty, and they held it. Okay. Okay, so these sisters wasn't joking. Now, you know, you can't get a treaty the whole three days because the relative power equation has gotten so far out of balance which is what we're all about remedying in the long run. The great Menelik of Ethiopia. Of course, a lot of you know Ethiopia was the only uh, African country never to be colonized by force. I mean, they talk about Sierra Leone, Liberia, but really, you know, I mean, all the rest of them, when the force came, they overrun them. When they came, Menelik fortunately had seen what was coming, knew what the Italians were going to be up to, saw what happened in the other countries then, just has spent a tremendous amount of resources and time accumulating arms, ammunition, weaponry. So when the thing did go down, you know, they were able to kick the kick the Italians out, you know, namely the Battle of Adua, 1896, but you know, some other ones. And maintain their sovereignty. And so they maintain it to this day, although as a revenge for that, he talked about them evading again when Haile Selassie was right. So you know they never forget. No. You know, you beat them one day, look what they're doing to Haiti. They're yes. still punishing Haiti for, right. yeah. for Toussaint L'Ouverture. They're yeah. still mad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, and they use everybody that you voted for to help them in that uh, yeah. endeavor. Yeah. You know what I mean. Everybody that you voted for. That's everybody right. that you voted for. Including Obama. That's everybody right. that, you voted for. Right. that you ever voted for. Mm -hmm. And Hillary Clinton. Crushing the hated patients. Yes, indeed. And the Venezuelans, by the way. Yes. Which is a point I want to just bring up quickly which is when you think about Nerere or when you think about uh, even the Haitian, but you think about some of these people r realize that they had to uh, get some cooperative uh, economic arrangements that were, that were less vulnerable to the international in external power. So if you look at Venezuela right now, one of the reasons they're having such a hard time, you know, knocking them out the box is because all of these little communal groups that have been developing over the years with all of the sanctions, with all of this stuff, they're able to figure out a way to feed themselves and keep themselves healthy. Right, right. You see? And so, so you can't just remove this leader and put this guy in and the whole thing collapses. So I think it's a lesson for us to know that we have to be grounded. You know, we have to be down at that level to where you can survive, you know, even the outside pressures. But we're not, we're not organized in that way right now. Our shining black prince, we know who this is. Yeah. Malcolm X and uh, his daughter was here not long ago took some nice pictures here that was nice but when I explained to them about Mal but you know a lot of them know Malcolm X right, right, right. you know the, the two people they know are Martin Luther King and Malcolm X mm -hmm. yeah. you know they know King more than they know Malcolm X right. but, they, but you know they'll know Mal they'll know about him right so mm -hmm. uh, Tetsueo. Uh, Tetsueo was uh, one of these great nephews of uh, Shaka, mm -hmm. and of course he had to struggle against the same South Africans, and uh, of course you know he won a lot of battles. They put their own movies out, Zulu Zulu Don, yeah. but you know, but uh, even in those movies, a little truth always slips in. But the bottom line is, you know, they still have that Zulu fighting spirit, and they won a lot, and, uh, and a lot of these people, of course, eventually are killed or exiled. And I I let them know, you know, this is a common theme, which is. You know, even with your courage, your organization, what have you, if you haven't developed the weaponry, 
if you haven't developed some means to protect yourself, or at least make it hard for them to sustain an attack, then you're going to lose. Akhenaten. Okay, Akhenaten was the either the son. What happened? Oh, here. Yeah. This is a t signal. I cannot, it was either the son or the nephew or something of Queen T, uh, Amenhotep IV, mm -hmm. changed his name to Akhenaten, and maybe some of you know he had, ch had moved the headquarters and uh, it was also spending a lot of energy trying to reorient the so quote unquote religion toward Aten, sun based. But a lot of people, if you Google it or something, they'll call him the father of monotheism. It's not exactly right, but the way the way they see it, the father of monotheism. One important thing that Moses and monotheism was a book written by Sigmund Freud before he died, and and in that book he talked about Moses, of course, being an Egyptian, which means he was an African, and he was an Egyptian during the the um, uh, time of Akhenaten's realm. Not not what am I trying to say? The uh, dynasty, right? So. Everything that you're reading about Moses, a lot of what you're reading about Moses, is reflective of him growing up in this Egyptian spiritual religious system. So, for instance, you know, the Ten Commandments, you know, you see that, and some of you have seen the uh, 47 uh, principles of Ma'at. Yeah, the admonitions of Ma'at, which they call the negative sin. A lot of these things track one for one. And so you're starting to recognize that, you know, whoever Moses was and whoever he left with, it wasn't who they said. And no, no, none other than Sigmund Freud, without saying these are Africans, but said these are Egyptians and what you're, and you know, circumcision, a lot of the other things that Moses supposedly brought with him with this monotheism, he had to take it out of here because that's where he was and that's the dynasty and that's the spiritual milieu from which he emerged. So I think that's important, especially to the Ghanaians because they're very much into it, you know, coming down with the two tablets from Mount Sinai, you know, it's in, you know. I say, well, that's plagiarism if we don't think your Lord's going to plagiarize like that. Maybe something else is going on. What else can we say? Bob Marley. I mean, you know, <laughs> he's everywhere. I think in that other video I was saying, that some people were saying the only two things you can find in the world anywhere is Bob Marley and Chinese restaurants. <laughs> and one of them we need a lot less than the other. Uh, Wangari Mathai, uh, you know, she's the lady that won the Nobel Prize. Interesting thing is the person who was painting this didn't know who she was at all. I just gave him a black and white picture. And something brought him to paint the whole thing green. And then he says, I said, why'd you paint it green? He says, I don't know. I just got here and I started. And then the green just fell, in the, you know, and of course she's known for, you know, ecology and the tree planting and all of the things. Wow. And so that's where she got her Nobel Prize. Wow. But if you read about her and watch a documentary that's out somewhere, extremely astute political, cultural, African cultural person. I mean, she's just not some late. In fact, she was always in trouble with the, the Kenyan government just for her political views. And she got a little measure of protection, I think, just based on her, you know, Nobel Prize for the, the ecological uh, stances and things. A lot of y'all saw um, Amistad Singbe Pie or Sinke. Uh, what I like about the reason he's here is because he gives me a chance again to talk to the Ghanaian students about the, the Middle Passage, gives me a chance to talk to them about the level of resistance that we pull together to get back home. Mm -hmm. Because see, you're talking to children, the only thing they know is everybody's trying to get out of here. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're eight years old and they're already trying to figure out, you know, how they're going to get out. And so I had to explain to them all of the struggling and fighting and everything. And what were they struggling on the ship for? What were they mutinying for? What were they doing that? What did they do when they finally took over the ship? Try to get back to Africa. Mm -hmm. So the children have to think, hmm, maybe we had something. Okay. <laughs> you know? And so, like I said, I have a reason for the different oh, yes, ones. But, sure. but you know about the Amistad and, and the mutiny. And they come from the US. I never saw the movie on the Amistad because I just, Something tells me I can't trust. Was it who else? Spielberg or 
Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. No, maybe not. I don't know who did it, whoever did it. I mean, just watch the first uh, 10 minutes. You love it. What? Just watch the first 10 minutes of Amistad. Okay, then turn it off. I mean, it's a good part to take over the ship and kill all them crackers. Now, Bumani. Can we all get along? Hey, you black people. <laughs> What's a cracker? <laughs> oh, excuse me, I'm a white devil. Uh, oh, that's <laughs> Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton. Yeah, yeah. The chairman. This is young Black Panther man. And you know, you know what always, almost invariably happens is that the <coughs> children, if they're more than about 12 years old, 10, 12, 13, I start talking about that, and the first thing they notice, 1948. You can see him yeah, counting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Jerry said, yeah. Was he 21? Because yeah. you know that's like 21. Why would they? And then I explain, you know, how they murdered him in his bed, and basically for his. Just for his potential. Yes. He's only 21. Yes. It's like killing him in the crib. Yes. Yes. And that is really shocking to these children that, you know, the government and the police and, the, you know, the whole system would come down on him. And they keep trying to force me to tell them what he did wrong. Yeah. And I said, well, he, no, no, but what did he do? And I said, well, you know, <laughs> no, 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 no. What crime did he commit? That's what they want to know. He's 21 years old. He was killed by the police. Because what crime did he commit? Yeah. And you know, I think the fact that I, they don't get an answer from me, sticks in their head. There's no crime. Good. The crime of trying to be a man mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. That's all. Black man. Black man. Yeah. And that, that's, so you never know how the reaction is going to be, you know, when they watch it. Maharero. Now, you know that the, the uh, Namibians, before they were Namibians, you know, well, this Herero group was basically, uh, is a form of genocide by the Germans at the time, because in Southwest Africa, the Germans were the colonizers. And so Samuel Maharero was just basically trying to protect and save his group from what was, you know, tens of thousands of just needless deaths driven out into the desert, starved to death. You can see like General von Trotha and some of the other German generals just saying outright, we're basically trying to eliminate the group. And if you don't cooperate, we're getting all of you out of there. So you may have seen pictures of these Herreros in Southwest Africa looking like they came out of the Nazi uh, camps. And that is where some of those techniques were actually practiced and generated that they used later on in the, in the World War II camps against the gypsies, the Jews, and the rest. Same Germans, same techniques. Practice. Same practice. Now we're all trying to get a, you know, a lot of these people trying to get to Germany. Wow. Okay, so Oliver Tambo in exile for most of the time, but you know, organizing, arm resistance, uh, just or international support for the anti-apartheid government. And of course, him and Winnie and the rest, keeping the ANC alive keeping it viable, keeping it going. Agustino Neto, another one of our, I hate to use the word renaissance because that uh, reflects back into Europe, but you know what I mean by renaissance men and the fact that he could do so much. Not only was he the leader of Angola against the Portuguese during the you know, colonial battles, he's a poet, he's a medical doctor, you know, the leader of the country, writer, just an all around something. So you had men like him, and Cabral, you know, not just fighting, organizing strategy, but thinking their way through how they were going to collapse this Portuguese empire. So that's the great Agustin Neto. I think he would be appalled to see what's going on in Angola today. And you know, his, one of his number two men was De Santos, the one who's president today, so go figure. Okay, now this was a girl, Zabeth, from Haiti. Now, there's very little information on her, but the reason I put her here is because what we know about her is that starting at nine years old, she was trying to escape. And she just kept escaping, kept running away. They catch her, they beat her, they torture her, she'd get out of there again. And there was one account where she had somehow got her hand caught in a sugar mill and it had cut off or bleeding and all of that. So they were t taking her in to the dispensary 
the pasture up and you know when they went out to get something came back home girl got through that window got out again <laughs> bleeding and all I mean and she was like 13 at that time so just that kind of spirit that you know you just won't ever give up never let down and also to let them how know how bad these youngsters wanted to get out of that situation they were in in the Americas that they're trying to get that they're still trying to get to. Uh, Bay Beret, after, after doing several Colgate commercials. <laughs> wow. That, that's cool. That's cool. No, but Bay Beret, serious. You know, that just came to my mind. That was, cut that out. That was just too, that was just too, too flippant. Too flippant. Wow. I just looked at him again. <laughs> but Baby Ray, this brother was serious. Now, you know what the British used to do, one of their favorite techniques, is they come into your country and they want you to work for them in your own country, of course, because there's not that many of them. So they want to slave you in their own country. So before they pull the guns out, they say, look, um, we want you to uh, pay us uh, to work for us. And they say, well, no, we don't, we're not going to work for you. They say, well, um, you have a hut tax that you have to pay in pounds, sterling, this kind of British currency. And they say, what, what are you talking about? What hut tax? You know, we've been living in these huts for how many generations? And you got to pay it in pounds. The only way you can earn it, of course, is go work for us. And they did the same thing in Kenya and even some parts of South Africa. Of course, Baby Ray said, you people have to be crazy. And he went to war. They went to war. They call them the hut tax wars in Sierra Leone. They were the Timne people. And he was a formidable opponent. I mean, he gave the British their money's worth. But they finally, of course, they did finally capture him and exile them. A lot of times, you know, you find that they exile these people to the Seychelles Islands and all of these different places, even the places in the Caribbean. Uh, mainly because if they kill them, yeah, they make them martyrs. And then that, now you've been able to butterfly, man. It's, no, not the butterfly. I had a wasp right here. You, the wasp was here? <laughs> no, no, we got to come. What do he look like? <laughs> Leroy, I told you not to come over here. He does that. You know, he just like to be seen. That's good. That's good. <laughs> All right. Now this one, okay, so this, the absurdity of the hut tax is really what I want to get across to the children. Not only that we resisted, but this is about the craziest thing you ever heard. You know? And then they, 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 they're like, what are you talking about? You know, that's how it is. Huh? Of course they went to the war. Come on. Lunch is ready. Okay. We probably ought to have lunch to make sure it's nice and hot and good. You know, this is, we can do this quickly on the, on the back side. If, if, you, if you want to, so. Okay. So we're working on it. And that bush, it, for those of you who don't, for some reason, don't make it back. That's the library I'm building there, okay. and uh, the next floor is going to be a uh, conference class area. So when we get done with the children, we'll I'll extend the walkway that way, and then we'll do the library. So you're going to, you're going to finish come back on this and explain. Okay, finish we'll really. come back on uh, Felix. 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 At XM Family, to be continued. And let me give you a glimpse of what you're going to be looking at. Exploration. This is not cars anyway. I, I, I need to go through and take my picture and take pictures of it in the future. And see if I can get it in a book.